Thanks a million, Julie. Thanks a million to the production team as a whole for the lovely music that you played. Like, I hope like that woke you all up a little bit uh, if you're in the afternoon phase of uh, your day. Um, and thank you also for those keeping, um, for those keeping uh, remarks, uh, Julie. It was appreciated that you did that for us. Uh, so good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Elena Giannini, and I'm one of the uh, Learning and Development Working Group uh, co-lead at the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. And I am here today with uh, um, Katie Robertson, who's the other co-lead like, for the Learning and Development Working Group. Uh, Katie, if you want to come off mute and just quickly introduce yourself, that would be great. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Eleanor. Hi, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm the other co-lead of the LND Working Group on behalf of Plan International. Very happy to be here today. And then here with us today, we also have Emily Faraday. Emily, if you want to introduce yourself quickly, thank you. Hi, nice to be here. Nice to meet everybody. My name is Emily Faraday. So I'm a, a humanitarian learning and development specialist. I work freelance, currently doing some work for UNICEF. Lovely to be here. Thanks, Emily. And last but not least, Tatiana Klein. Tatiana, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tatiana Klein, Learning and Development Specialist in the um, Office of Emergency Programs at UNICEF. So thank you. So it's lovely to be here with you all today. I see that some of you have already started to introduce yourself in the chat. Feel free to continue to do so. Uh, so we have a sense of who's in the room at this point of the day. It's the last session of the second day of this an annual meeting for the Alliance. So um, I hope we will manage to keep you entertained. And um, uh, I am going to ask uh, um, a quick question actually and if the production team can actually share the Mentimeter that we have prepared and uh, my question is what is um, sorry have you ever used the competency framework and I can see someone has already responded yes which is great <laughs> you were faster than me um, yeah if you can just take a second and please uh, uh, include your answer in the Menti that has been shared in the chat. I am just gonna be silent for a second. So I see a no coming from Francisco in the chat, more from Kelly, no again. Sergio, also a no. Simon, no. Oh, the Menti link has not been shared. So that's why, like, it's uh, it's fine. Let's continue through the chat. I see that there are several nodes coming through, which gives us a sense, the lack of, uh, um, okay, so no. Okay, yes, we have realized there was the wrong poll, which was shared. It was the opening poll, which is fine. It was, I was maybe a bit too quick, like in moving like to this Menti, it should be showing now, but I saw that uh, there were several nodes that were coming through the chat. And now there are some yes to also showing in the results of the Menti. And uh, we are almost on equal level now, no taking over, more nodes. <laughs> some more yeses to well this is just uh, to get you into the mood like for this session which is about uh, competency-based learning and child protection and how these two uh, themes come together and I see that like again like you know the answers like to the mentoring are a bit changing but we have about 12 no's and some yes some yes, this is too. But uh, to continue with this session, I think it's good to actually take a step back and actually reflect a little bit on what is a competency? What is competency-based learning? And why is this important? And to actually talk about this and to answer these difficult questions, like for us, I leave the floor to Emily, who is the um, a learning and development specialist for humanitarian settings. So over to you, Emily, for these questions. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. Thanks for that introduction. 
So yes, yeah, so as Elena said, I'm going to speak for a couple of moments about what competencies are and what competency-based learning is. So as you can see on the slide there, there's a definition of competencies. So a competency is a statement of an outcome or objective that someone is able to achieve in their professional role. So there's often quite a lot of confusion over what they are, but really simply, they are just statements or expressions of something that a person should be able to do in their professional role. So these aren't the same as tasks. They're not a one-time thing that you can tick off your to-do list. They're habitual or ongoing. They're a way of doing something. And they're also not the same as skills. So they're at a higher level and they imply some sort of purpose or objective. They sort of capture that bigger picture about how you use your skills. So if we could look at the next slide, please, we'll look at some examples. So on this slide here, you can see four different examples. I've chosen these four because they illustrate different types of competencies. So the example there top left applies humanitarian principles, standards and guidelines. This is an example of a sectoral competency, in this case, humanitarian. So this is a competency that applies to anybody who is working in the humanitarian sector. You need to be able to apply humanitarian principles, standards and guidelines. The example on the top right is a functional competency. In this case, strengthens national and local capacity to respond and lead. This is, a, is an example that was taken from the competency framework for coordinators that UNICEF uses for its cluster coordinators. So a functional competency relates to your role. So your function could be caseworker, it could be project manager, it could be financial manager, trainer, for example, or a mixture of some of those. So this is a functional competency that describes some of the things that you should be able to do in your role. Bottom left detects and treats malnutrition is an example of a nutrition competency. So this is a technical competency. So equally here, we could have child protection competencies. We could have an education in emergencies competency, for example. And then bottom right manages ambiguity and complexity. This is an example of a behavioral or an organizational competency. This one is taken from the UNICEF behavioral competency framework, which applies to everybody who works for UNICEF. So other organizations might also have behavioral competencies. Behavioural competencies really capture what some people might call soft skills or interpersonal skills, really capturing the way that you work together with other people. Now, as you can see, competencies themselves don't have levels. These are expressions of things that people might do at different levels. So competencies are then accompanied by behaviours which provide really specific examples of actions that you can take. And this is where the levels come in. So often competencies are, are accompanied by behaviours at, at three or sometimes five different levels that would describe the different uh, and specific things that you would be able to do. Can we have the next slide, please. So in competency frameworks, you see the competencies and the behaviours at various levels, but these are underpinned by skills, knowledge and attitudes or beliefs. And sometimes these are expressed in the competency framework, but often they're not actually articulated there. These are articulated in curricula that go along with the competency framework. So just to give you an example, if we're looking at the competency strengthens national and local capacity to respond and lead, you might have a knowledge area around localization frameworks, you might require contextual knowledge, for example. In terms of the skills, you might need communication skills, facilitation skills, negotiation skills, for example. And then in terms of the attitudes, you might need several beliefs around that this is important, that it's important to strengthen national and local capacity. You might need some attitudes um, around, for example, humility, the way that you approach uh, your work is with humility, for example. Um, so it's important to understand this because it, this feeds into how we look at competency-based learning. So these skills, knowledge and attitudes feed into the manifestation or the demonstration of the competency. 
Could we see the next slide, please? So in terms of competency-based learning, if you look at the first bullet point here, so the purpose of competency-based learning is to build competencies. So the question to ask here is, how will this learning make me better at my job? Because of this question, we're already thinking about the transferal of learning into professional contexts. So it's well documented that it can be difficult to transfer or apply something that we've learned in a workshop, for example, in our actual work. But competency-based learning can support this transferal. But competency-based learning isn't just directly about acquiring competencies. So we can all recognize examples that directly build competencies. So for example, simulations are an example of this. You practice demonstrating the competency in action in a specific context. But competency-based learning can also build the underlying skills, knowledge, and attitudes. The difference is that the end goal is the starting point. So we start off from this view of, what do I need to do in my job? And therefore, what skills do I need? So this is a very different approach from starting from, I'm going to learn this skill, and then how can I use that in my role? It's a, a, a different way of thinking about it. If we can look at the next slide, please, we'll look at why this is important. So competency-based learning improves role performance so that our work objectives are more likely to be achieved. It's not about learning for learning's sake, but it's a focus on how we perform in our role. And this can be more motivating for adults. So we know from adult learning theory that people are motivated when they can see a concrete application of what they're learning. And for workplace learning, this is really essential because that means there's a more efficient use of resources, increases the impact of the learning, and it can lead to more sustainable results. It's also important because it feeds into a larger, consistent and measurable HR system. So it can support recruitment and the selection of appropriate candidates. It can support performance management and professional development because we have these objective criteria that are measurable and consistent. So that's the end of my presentation for now. So thank you for listening. I hope that was very clear, but I believe that there is an opportunity at the end to ask questions if, if anything needs clarification. So thank you. Thank you very much, Amelia. I think it was very clear and interesting. Um, yes, there is an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Feel free to drop those questions in the chat. I will try and monitor them as we go along. Now that we have centered ourselves and um, taken a step back, look back at what a competency is, why is it important to use a competency-based learning approach? Um, maybe it's good to also speak about like what we have done as the LND working group uh, on the CPHA competency framework. And uh, to, to this effect, I will leave the floor to Katie Robinson. Katie, over to you. Thank you, Eleanor, and thank you, Emily. That was great. Um, perfect. So I'm going to talk a bit about the Child Protection in Humanitarian Action Competency Framework, which is an alliance resource, um, which you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, we're just revising it at the moment, and the new version will be available in the next couple of weeks. So um, you're getting a head start on finding out about the framework. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the purpose of the Child Protection in Humanitarian Action Competency Framework is to contribute to an improved, to improve child protection outcomes in humanitarian settings by providing an interagency set of competencies required by CPHA practitioners. So it broadly describes the expected standards of performance that can be applied to different roles within the sector. The CPHA Competency Framework builds on and aligns with the structure of the minimum standards for child protection. So if you're familiar with the minimum standards, the, the way that the competency framework is organized will be very familiar um, and hopefully will make it easier to use. Uh, within the framework, we have technical and behavioral competencies. So Emily's just explained this to us. So we, ha we have both um, for child protection. It's a sector-wide guidance, um, and the, the idea is that it will make us more accountable, more effective, and um, 
make the work that we're doing more predictable by having an agreed set of, of uh, competencies and behaviours alongside those. If we could go to the next slide. Perfect. So the competency framework is for individuals, organisations, coordination groups and training and learning providers. And each of these can, can use the framework in different ways. So individuals working in the CPHA sector or aspiring to work in the sector can use the framework to reflect on their own capabilities to identify strengths and areas for development and to identify future career and uh, professional development aspirations. Organisations that employ child protection staff or volunteers can use the framework to um, map CPHA capacity to kind of see what they already have and what gaps they might have to identify priority areas for recruitment or development of staff to inform planning and organisational design um, to recruit staff. So by using the competency framework to design competency based job descriptions and selection processes to conduct performance management that's structured and aligned to an agreed set of standards, and to identify continued professional development steps for, for staff and teams. Coordination groups can use the framework to assess capacity strengths and gaps across a response, and to define priority areas for capacity strengthening and inform capacity strengthening plans. And training and learning providers can use the framework to conduct targeted learning needs assessments and to inform the design of learning programs and products to support CPHA practitioners at all levels. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how the framework is structured. I mentioned it's aligned with the child protection minimum standards. So it has three main sections. The first is uh, the guiding principles for child protection and parental action. So the same as in the minimum standards, we start with the guiding principles. And um, so we have in the competency framework, a set of competencies which describe the expected behaviours that should be employed to role model the guiding principles that are essential to fully implementing child protection in humanitarian action programming. We then have child protection technical competencies. So this is the, the description of the technical knowledge, skills and attitudes that CPHA practitioners need to demonstrate to be effective in their roles. And these are organised um, into groups in the same structure as the minimum standards. So we have competencies for a quality response, we have um, competencies related to child protection risks and strategies and working across sectors. And then we have some core humanitarian competencies. So these describe the core behaviours that child protection practitioners need to demonstrate to effectively operate in humanitarian settings specifically. And these are adapted from the core humanitarian competency framework and made a bit more specific to child protection. Um, and then as Emily mentioned, there's often levels within a competency framework. Our framework has three levels. So level one describes individuals who are predominantly involved in the implementation of child protection in humanitarian action activities or with limited experience in the competency domain. Level two describes individuals who are predominantly involved in the coordination and management of CPHA activities or with some experience in the relative competency domain. And then level three is those predominantly involved in leading CPHA programs and strategic thinking or with significant experience in the relative, relative, relevant competency domain. And you may be at a different level for different competency domains. If we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So as I mentioned, the revised version of the framework will be released later this month. And then there's also some um, resources that will be coming your way to help people to make use of the competency framework. So specifically, we will have a, a set of three tools. So one tool to help you to design competency-based job descriptions based on the CPHA competency framework. One tool to help you design uh, competency-based interviews and one tool to help with competency-based appraisals and L&D planning um, for yourself or for your team members. We'll then have uh, a short introductory training, so it's about half a day, um, which introduces the competency framework in a bit more detail and also gives you a chance to have a practice using these different tools so you uh, can get to grips with those a bit more. Then we will be working on a competency development guide, which will map 
available CPHA learning and development resources against the competency framework. So you'll be able to um, see for a specific competency, if you've identified you'd like to strengthen your uh, capacity in that particular area, you'll be able to see which learning development resources are available that relate to that competency. And then we will be putting together some examples of practical uses of the framework. So ways that different members of the Alliance or um, other child protection organizations have used the framework just to give some more uh, ideas and suggestions for how you can use it yourself. So that was a specific request we received recently. I think that's all from me for now. So I will hand back to you, Eleanor. Oh no, the mentee, sorry, I've got a mentee. That's a um, if we could share the link to the next mentee, perfect, thank you. So we just thought we would check at this point, um, what, oh, somebody's very quick. Okay, which tool sounds the most useful? So of the um, accompanying resources with the framework, is there anything that sounds particularly useful? And then there is also a second question around what other support do you think you might need to make use of the framework in your own work? Okay, great. I see lots of different answers. So that's good news. Um, job descriptions and interview guidance, job descriptions, the training. Yeah, so we do have the training now, but we need to update it to the uh, revised version of the framework. So that should be available quite soon as well. Um, examples, competency based interviewing and trainings. Okay, brilliant. Could we go to the second question? Yeah, okay, great. How to webinars and maybe a launch. Yes, so we are planning a launch webinar. I'm glad somebody mentioned that. Um, so we will have a webinar to launch the framework and to give a bit more detail on how it actually looks. We'll be able to show you how it actually looks, which I think will be helpful. Um, tips for managers to support strengthening the job. Yes, okay, great. Capacity building job descriptions. Okay. Perfect. Well, please do continue to add your suggestions into this question and we will take a look as we finalise the framework itself. We can look at what else we can do to help make it as useful as possible. Um, but for now, Eleanor, I'm going to hand back to you. Thanks, Katie. That was great. And uh, yes, feel free to continue inputting on your suggestions on what else you would need from us, because Katie and I would definitely pick up on your suggestions as uh, uh, we finalize the competency framework and the, the develop and while we develop the competency development guide. And um, now, basically, to move away a little bit from the theory and go more into the practice, we have thought like uh, we had heard of a great example from our colleagues at UNICEF, Tatiana, more specifically. So I would like to leave the floor to Tatiana to actually tell us a little bit how the CPHA competency framework has been used or is used uh, to promote the centrality of protection, uh, sorry, the centrality of children and their protection. So how it has been used like in your case, Tatiana. And uh, over to you, over to you, Tatiana. Sorry, stumbling on my English. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Elena. And thank you, Emily, for introducing what a competency is so clearly and Katie for the overview of the CPHA. So it makes it all easier. Um, so I'm Tatiana in the Office of Emergency Programs. I'm not a child protection practitioner. So that's an important context for this. And my role is not to build the capacity or, or to deliver training, design and deliver training for child protection practitioners. So um, that's the context in which um, I, I came across the CPHA. So one aspect of my role has been to develop new training materials for local NGO and CBO partners. Um, and then based on competencies that would be required for child-centered humanitarian action. So UNICEF's competency framework, um, sorry, uh, policy framework and learning framework is based on topics like humanitarian advocacy, humanitarian principles, human rights, ethical evidence generation, humanitarian coordination, access, supply, 
um, accountability to affected population, needs assessments, you know all these terms and you've been engaged with all of these processes. Um, so we're developing training modules based on using a competency-based approach. Um, next slide, please. Oh, it might be on. Oh, next slide. My apologies. I missed that. Um, so the next slide, I've already talked to this one. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we've worked on, um, uh, so the, the, the training is the learning framework that is not specific for child protection practitioners. So the quick key question that brought me to look at the CPHA um, was what is child-centered humanitarian action? So how do you do a child-centered needs assessment? How do you do, um, child-centered humanitarian advocacy? What does that mean in terms of competency? So what's different about working with children? I'd initially drawn very heavily on the global core competency, uh, core humanitarian competency framework, um, the one that's used by many agencies, but that doesn't really include the child-centered component. So then I had a look at the CPHA. So now I'm going to hand over to you. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. We have a Mentimeter, so, and the question is, what does child-centered humanitarian action mean for humanitarians who are not child protection practitioners? Just try to come up with one or two words. Try not to use the term child protection. Um, so what does child-centered here mean? So I often used myself, I'm an, former education specialist. So what does an education specialist need to know about protecting children? Notice I put it back to front to take it away from the sector specialists and say, we all have a role in protecting children, right? So wash, wash practitioners, education practitioners, health practitioners, we all need to protect children. And if we're using a child-centered approach, what is it that we do the way that Emily explained competencies, the doing. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really interesting responses. Children at the center. Child lens, yes. Yep. Thank you. This is great. Maybe 10 more seconds. I'm not sure when to close the Mentimeter, but I'll give you a sort of 10 second warning. I think 10 seconds just... sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Thank you. And I'm so glad I asked you this question because I've spent a year trying to figure out what it means and what you've put there. I mean, you can all see what's coming up there in the um, mind map. Um, and it's it's a summary of, of what I what I've raised. So a lot of people are focusing here on child participation meaningful child participation, working with children, the voices of children. Um, and then there's a theme on protection, you know, preventing and responding to, um, uh, to protect children. Um, the developmental stages, absolutely. I was thinking you need to have a knowledge of the developmental stages to be child centered and a lot of us as non-child protection practitioners might not know those so from a training perspective that's that's important um family strengthening socio-ecological model yeah oh i'm going to keep this fantastic thank you i'm getting more out of this presentation than you so can we move to the next slide please 
thank you. Um, so just a bit of context for how I came to be doing this. UNICEF in 2020 did a um, humanitarian review where it was identified that we're looking to improve the skills, the competencies of partners. One of the priorities was to, if all the partners are trained in the same way, the same principles, then we could have a true localized response to support the predictability of UNICEF's child-centered humanitarian action. So that what that tells me now that you've had a chance to reflect on it in your Mentimeter responses is how do partners um, uh, gain the competencies to do meaningful child participation? How do they get the competencies to work with children effectively, to understand uh, developmental phases, to understand um, system family strengthening, um, socio-ecological models? How do NGO partners who are not uh, contracted to do child protection specifically, where do they learn that? Um, so next slide, please. Uh, the basis that UNICEF uses is the um, core commitments for children and humanitarian action. The key policy statement there is to deliver principled, timely, quality and child-centred humanitarian ad response and advocacy. Can I get a quick show of hands, just looking at just an electronic hand, whether you've heard of the core commitments for children or not? Can't see everybody, so it might not be... Just a quick, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, a lot of people, thank you. Um, over to the next slide, please. So then um, we reviewed the CPHA competency framework and on the left of the table, I've got the draft HELS humanitarian learning modules. So module one is framing UNICEF's child-centered humanitarian action. So then the, one of the um, components of that training module is introducing child-centered and the CPMS. And so in order to, to, to determine what the content and learning objectives of that module would be, I drew very heavily on the competencies and behaviors from level one and level two, mostly level one of the CPHA, the section called working with children. Um, for the next module, Protecting Children in Humanitarian Action, we used that term intentionally to say that it was for everyone. The first version said child protection, and then people said, oh, but why are you training people in child protection? That's not part of the, the, the work that you're focused on. Um, so change it to protecting children. So we drew very heavily on the competencies and behaviours, um, preventing and responding to child protection risks and are currently designing content and methodologies for a module on that. And then looking at child-centered humanitarian advocacy, the competency on implementing communication and advocacy strategies. Some behaviors in that section were incredibly useful. Um, and we've turned them into learning objectives and learning indicators. Um, when you're doing accountability to affected populations and in community engagement, it's key to understand working with children and protecting children through all of those AAP processes. Um, and then one that's a little bit more of a tenuous link, but um, we, we have a, a program approach called Community Engagement for Social and Behaviour Change, um, and there are links there to the developed strategies to strengthen family and caregiving environments. So I'm looking at those behaviors and seeing how that can be integrated. So how did we make these decisions of what to include and what not to include? Um, so it was the extent to which the indicator is applicable to all humanitarian workers, um, the extent to which the indicator is relevant to one or more of the UNICEF's policy framework, the core commitments. So AAP, protection, PCA, safeguarding um, as examples. Uh, and then there were indicators that are in the CPHA that were not child sp specific, were excluded because we already have those in the learning framework. So understanding humanitarian context is something that we already have and what we had already written was very similar to what was written in the CPHA already. Um, next slide, please, because I've got some questions for you subject to time. Um, so this might be one for a show of hands, if that can work with the facility. Okay could get some help from the production team to see who has the hand up because I can't see everybody's hand. Um, 
Um, so it's, and you can answer, respond to any of the questions. It's just a quick brainstorm. So I've got here, what are the specific impacts on children during an emergency? So what's different if there's a, you understand the humanitarian context. What is it that people need to know about the impacts of children in humanitarian contexts? Um, and then working with children, what do you think? To what extent is this kind of training relevant for all humanitarian partners? Um, does anyone else have any training that they use on working with children? Um, and then preventing and responding to child protection risks. Do other humanitarian partners provide training on this? Um, in addition to training on PSEA. Right, so it's really the child protection risks. And is it relevant? Is it needed? Um, so just some brainstorming questions. Um, best interests of the child was one. To what extent is this a relevant training for all humanitarian partners? That's the question I've been asking. Not at the, not at the level of conducting a best interest assessment, right? So not at that level, but the, the, the principle of best interests of the child and really understanding it. I think we see it in a lot of lists and things, but you know, do people really know what that means? Um, and to what extent is meaningful participation of children? You know, is that relevant for all humanitarian partners who are not child protection practitioners? So I'm just putting up some questions and it's really just a one minute brainstorm if anyone has any thoughts they'd like to share please please do and if i could get assistance showing the who has their hand up i can let you know if I oh, you can see, see? Anything oh, coming thanks. Up. all right thanks i think maybe we want to repeat the question um yeah it's really any thoughts that anyone has on training partners training mm -hmm. ngo and cbo partners in child participation best interests of the child working with children child protection um, how relevant are those competencies see there is an end up and i see that uh, brikena from in the chat has mentioned that, that she really appreciates uh, the focus on the best interest of the child principle. Uh huh. Ah, yes. I see that now. I spotlit Bjorn. He had his hand up. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bjorn. Thanks, thank, thank you, Bjorn. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Yep. Okay, thank I you. I can hear you well. I can see you, Bjorn. Nice to meet you. Oh, thank you. So I think competency based. Uh, training in child protection and also participation of children in humanitarian uh, situations is quite vital and is quite important. Uh, in, in most humanitarian situations, uh, children-centered policies are usually not uh, that, that, that popular as much as they're there. They are not as per se so much child-centered because we usually find that uh, the humanitarian responses are quite, kind of like just diverse on the whole situation, but not focusing mainly on children. The impact here on focusing on children is that humanitarian situations actually have much more impact on the children themselves, not only on their developmental aspects, but also in long terms, in long term impacts on how these children get to develop. So bringing in kids and having a child centered uh, competency based in humanitarian response is quite important because when these kids are engaged and when children are engaged, we usually find that they are usually better responses in terms of the, the humanitarian responses that are actually being done. And the children feel that they are that, that they're engaged and that they're contributing to the solutions of the situations that are actually there. So it tends to end up uh, building the children well in the long in the long run compared to, to a short-term uh, solutions that are needed. So I think that one is quite important in terms of training humanitarian uh, activists and also humanitarian actors in a humanitarian situation. Uh, thank you, Bior. It's, it's really insightful and great to hear you say that. I spoke with a, one of UNICEF's uh, emergency uh, implementing partners and they said, I said, oh, what, what are the skills required for an effective emergency response? And he said, oh, we don't need UNICEF to train us in emergency response. We've been doing that forever. We don't understand the working with children part. So that's just to share one that I said, oh, yes, okay. What does that mean? Um, and part of that is what Bjorn just highlighted. So thanks very much, Bjorn.
And I believe also the Iraq app, like state, reinstated the importance of, uh, you know, considering the best interest of the child, the child. as guiding principles. And Valeria too. So there is overall an agreement around that, Tatiana. Mm -hmm. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, thank you so much. I saw a couple of comments there on best interests of the child. And I say that as a non-child protection practitioner, I only learnt what that meant a couple of years ago when I was delivering training. Yeah, what it means in a deep way, not in a, right? What does that mean in your decision making? And you often hear people making decisions that don't consider the best interests of the child because they haven't had that exposure to that to that principle. Um, so I think it's a really important training need. Um, okay, that's it from me. I think I'm. That, that's the. That's my last slide. And now we go to the general comments and questions, don't we, Elena? Yes, so it's Tatiana. not for this section. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much for the presentation. And it was lovely to hear uh, the experience like of UNICEF in using our own CPHA competency framework. I will ask the question, uh, I will ask Katie to keep an eye on the chat. I have like a couple of questions that I can pose like to speakers so given we have a few extra minutes. So we might be able to take a couple of questions. Um, but yeah, Katie, if you can keep an eye on the chat, just in case. Um, so my first question actually is uh, for Emily. And what I wanted to ask is, how do you think is, uh, um, or could our, our competency framework or a competency framework more in general be used and be useful in training design, Emily? Over. So how a competency framework can be used in training design. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, there's lots of ways in which you can use a competency framework to inform training design. But I think, as I was saying in my presentation, it's really important to start from the competencies themselves. So start with thinking about this is the thing that we want people to be able to do when they leave this training course. But then you need to go deeper than that. So you need to think about do people already have this competency and if they don't have it what are the underlying reasons for that is that because they lack the skills is it because they lack the knowledge or is there something outside of that that's going on so oftentimes I've seen that people will design a training that will tell people things that they already know when actually it's not uh, it's not what they need they don't need information they might already know the underlying facts or have those knowledge areas so I think a really important thing is to really dig deeper into the competency and try to understand where the learning gaps are and I think a competency framework can help you keep your eye on the end goal of where you're trying to get with the competencies but also to really unpack those kind of elements of if people aren't demonstrating this competency in their professional life what is it that's that's leading to that thanks emily that's great i think i will feel this from you keeping an eye on the end goal <laughs> it's gonna be my my motto um, in uh, learning design for the future. And maybe one um, complex question also for Tatiana. Um, how do you think is competency-based learning important in efforts around the localization? And I'm asking you this question in particular because you're working with lots of CDOs, UNICEF partners, et cetera, and you're not specifically a CPHA expert. So I thought it would be great to hear from you on this. Yeah, a really good question. Um, I think that it's that if we consider, I'm, I'm going to focus, I mean, there are many aspects to localization. So my response is very specific to the development of skills and knowledge. I'm, I'm not using competencies intentionally for a moment. So <laughs> the development of skills and knowledge. So if partners need to develop skills and knowledge because those skills and knowledge will contribute to national partners leading the emergency preparedness and response right that's one of the big emergency that's one of the big goals of localization is that local partners start to lead and in our case it's emergency preparedness and response um so then the question is what do what are the given that every context every country every culture every religion every social dynamic is completely different so then how do you design a training that suits the 
vast number of contexts that we all work in for our humanitarian response. So the competencies give us a, a set of benchmarks that can be used, right? This is what we're aiming for. How that happens in different contexts will vary significantly. The training will look really different. The case studies will be different. So if we use best interests of the child as an example or child participation uh, or working with children, the social cultural environment in which that happens will always be different, particularly if you go to the very sort of local level and the, and the um, delivery and implementation that national and local partners do. But the, um, the learning objectives can be the same. And I say that based on assumption that some of the competencies can be translated into learning objectives and translated into learning indicators. So they could be quite standard. So if you look at the CPHA behaviors, if you read those, they're not culturally specific. They're open to everybody, right? But then when you deliver the training based on that, you contextualize it, but that indicator can be the same. So I think that to respond to your question, that's how competencies can be used in the context of localization when focused on uh, developing skills. Thanks. Thanks a million, Tatiana. That was uh, great. I think it goes back like someone, I think in the opening section was speaking about the complexities of working in child protection, human set and action. I think it was Bill Ford. So, so I think we go back to how complex, like uh, really uh, the reality also of uh, child protection and humanitarian action interventions are or humanitarian concepts most generally. Mm -hmm. So designing learning program that can suit all of those needs, like it's a mm -hmm. challenge in itself, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe I'll just pose another like final question before I actually leave the floor to Annie with uh, some uh, uh, two actual uh, some insight on tomorrow's uh, third day. So one last question for Emily, given we have like a few more minutes. Um, how do you think should uh, an individual practitioner interact with uh, child protection or a competency framework more generally? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm glad you asked me this question actually, because I think sometimes people feel that competency frameworks are just for the use of organizations yeah. and, and more specifically for the learning and development department within them. But I think a lot of that comes from a feeling that perhaps they're a bit overwhelming, they can be a bit scary, but I would really counsel people to just dive in and have a look. I think when you start reading a competency framework, you don't need to sit down and read the whole thing in one go, but you can start figuring out what they mean they're actually much more accessible than they might seem from a distance so have have a look first I think is the first step because I think it's a really important way of taking control of your own learning and of the options that are available to you if you have a look at Agora or if you have a look at Kaya Connect if you have a look at Disaster Ready there are endless numbers of online modules available. Um, there's endless numbers of face-to-face -face trainings that we can attend, there's things that we can read. And I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed with the learning opportunities that are out there and, and really not know where to start. And that can go too easy that we can freeze and not do anything, or we can just find that we're doing endless courses. So I think starting from something like the uh, the minimum, the uh, CPHA competency framework or, or another competency framework can help us to really focus um, our attentions so that we can be more efficient in the use of our time. So I would really counsel reading it, um, looking at the behaviours and trying to self-assess uh, where you are in that competency framework to really try and identify your strengths and your weaknesses. So you can do this by yourself, you can do your own personal reflection on that, or you can work with colleagues or peers or, or perhaps the supervisor to help them to, to um, give you reflections on where you are, so where your strengths and weaknesses are, so that you can get a realistic idea of, of your own performance. And from that, you can identify some priority areas. Don't try to build all of your competencies all at once, but maybe identify a handful, perhaps just three that are real priorities for you. 
and then from there try to identify learning opportunities that will address those competencies. So I was really excited to hear actually that you're working on a competency guide that will guide people in that way. So this is the competency that I want to build. This is where I can um, address that learning because that that gives you a more efficient use of your time rather than trying to cover everything when perhaps some of those are already strengths of yours and you don't need to, to build those skills. So um, just to summarize, I would say, read the competency framework, try to assess your own competencies alone or, or with somebody that you trust, and then really focus your attention on building the areas that you think are real areas that you need to develop, not on covering everything. Thank you very much, Emily. That is great. Like, um, yes, don't be scared. Open the competency framework. We assure you, we'll try our best to make it as simple as possible to navigate. And a call to supervisors like Emily was uh, hinting a manager to, to perhaps like help you um, support your teams like with their learning. Have a look at the competency framework. You might find um, some guidance there while you wait, like also for the CPHA competency development guide, which is upcoming. And with these remarks, um, Yes, the links like to the materials will be provided. As mentioned by Katie, the competency framework is currently under revision. So stay tuned because it will come like we will advertise it on social media and on the community of practice. So you will see that coming. With this, I want to thank like the panel, Tatiana, Emily, and of course, Katie, um, not only for their session today, but they're also together with other practitioners with their level of engagement support that they have extended in the revision of the competency framework. You have been like a uh, great support for us, like uh, for Katie and I, like in brainstorming and um, improving the competency framework. And I think like it's really an improvement. So with this, I thank you all once again, and I thank the participants for uh, staying like throughout well done, and I leave the floor to Annie Mansurian just for some quick insights like on tomorrow's sessions, because there are some really cool sessions coming up tomorrow, so don't leave quite yet, just, and thanks again to everyone. Mm -hmm.